Hey guys, I'm Josh. And I'm Jessica. Welcome to The Branch. We're so glad that you're here. Why don't you let us know that you're here and pull up The Branch app and check in. You may not know this, but for years we have been funding the drilling of water wells in Kenya and many parts of East Africa through Christian Relief Fund. Many of these places have not received rain in years. And we just received a word of thanks from CRF CEO Milton Jones. Check this out. Hi, Chris. Want to give greetings to all the branch there. I love the church there at Farmer's Branch. And I want to thank you for the many, many ways over a lot of years that you have helped Christian Relief Fund. I'm standing here in Samburu, Kenya. We are here in this part of East Africa and it hasn't rained here in years. And yet today we're drilling a water well and within the week we're gonna have a lot of water, clean water, good water. They say that water is life here in Samburu. And not only did we bring water to this place, we planted a church today. And it is just fantastic. I wish you could have been here because it's a brand new church and 30 to 40 people uh, came to faith in Jesus Christ. I got to preach there and share the message of Jesus with them. And it was just an exciting day. You would have loved it at the branch. And in fact, you were with us because you help us so much. There are about 600,000 people today in Kenya that will be drinking fresh water from one of our wells. And we want to thank you because you have given so much, especially over in Turkana, so that people can have clean water. And there's also, in the last three years, I think we planted 300 churches that we planted when people came to believe in the mighty works of God through giving water. And then they believed in Jesus and the living water. And you're a part of something really good. And I just want to thank you a trillion times for your love, your generosity, and your grace. God bless you. And we are going to continue partnering with Christian Relief Fund in large part because of your generosity. So thank you. And ladies, Women in the Word is back at our Vista Ridge campus on Monday nights at 7 p.m. We are going to be studying the book of Jeremiah for 10 weeks. And if you are looking for a place to connect with other women and you're looking for a place to study the Word, this is it. We would love for you to join us on Monday nights at Vista Ridge and you can register on the Branch app. The study begins June 6th. Also, this Monday and every Monday for the summer, Branch Moms is hosting a play group from 10 to 11.30 at our Farmers Branch campus. We do ask that caregivers stay at the building during the play group. There are going to be so many activities for your child to do. We can't wait and we hope that you join us. This weekend, we are continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. So you can go ahead and be pulling up your sermon notes on the Branch app. Again, we are so glad that you're here. Welcome to the Branch.
For our God is me, every heart. Let your mercy rise, let your hope breathe down. Let your love in our hearts be found. Let your grace run free. Let your name bring peace. Heaven come in the here and now. Let your mercy rise. Let your amazing what kids pick up from their parents. I know of a father who was out with his five-year-old little girl and they had to run into a toy store to pick up uh, a rather expensive toy for a family member of theirs that they were going to surprise at a birthday party with. And as they were leaving the toy store, he noticed that his five-year-old had a rather expensive automated toy in her hand that she was just going to walk out the door with. And he stopped her and said, honey, we didn't buy that. You go put that back. And she said, but I want it, daddy. And he said, honey, daddy doesn't have enough money right now to buy it. And she looked at him like he was an idiot and said, just charge it, silly. And to her, credit cards are the perfect alternative you work with if you don't have enough money. And when I heard that story, I I can't help but think that that little girl's response reminds all of us that there are times when we believe we're walking in the light on a matter that in fact we're really in the dark on. Our kids need all kinds of instruction, for example, when it comes to the way things really work with money, probably a lot of us do as adults, (laughs) and there's no doubt we as disciples of Jesus need that kind of instruction as well. If you haven't visited church in a long time, if this is your first time in a long time at church and you've always felt that all the church ever does is talk about money, you've picked some day to visit I mean, you need to go to Vegas because of all things, our series through the Sermon on the Mount brings us to a particular teaching of Jesus and what he has to say about our relationship with money and with material possessions. If you're a guest here, we have been in a series in the Gospel of Matthew. We walked through the life of Jesus from Christmas to Easter, and then after Easter, we came back around and we're spending time in the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And today, 
Our series brings us to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. Jesus says to his disciples, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the words store up stand out to me here. I read recently that there is so much square footage in America that we have dedicated to self-storage facilities in our country that there's enough square footage just in self-storage facilities to hold every man, woman, and child. Every individual American could have their own four square feet of space. Every American, man, woman, and child could fit inside the combined square footage of self-storage units in our country. We're a country that loves to store things. When the Egyptian pharaohs were buried in pyramids, the reason they had pyramids, one of the reasons is they were trying to be buried with their most expensive treasures. They did it in the hopes that maybe they could take their treasures with them to enjoy in the afterlife. It makes me think about the fella who, he wasn't really a person of faith, but he wanted to keep all of his gold and his valuables in the attic of his home. He told his wife, whatever you do, don't move them because when I die, in case there is a heaven, I want to take them with me. Well, sure enough, he dies. Of course, they don't go anywhere. She's up in the attic a few weeks after the funeral, and she sees all of the gold and the precious valuables that he had up there in a locker, and she thought, oh dear, I knew I should have put it in the basements. When Jesus speaks of heaven here in this passage, I don't think he's talking exclusively about amassing treasures in the way that the Egyptian pharaohs thought, actual treasures on the other side in the afterlife for you to enjoy and how you live in this realm is connected to you enjoying a 401k in the next realm. Remember the context, we're in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Sermon on the Mount, it's his first sermon that's building upon his first declaration in the Gospel of Matthew 4 and 17 when he says the kingdom of heaven has come near. How has it come near? It's come near in him. What he was saying is the kingdom of God, the reign of God is present through Jesus on the earth. The activity of God, the rule of God, the work of God had come near. And so when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven and the Sermon on the Mount, he's not talking about heaven as in that place of golden streets and chocolate fountains on the other side that you go to when you die. When he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about the realm in which God is at work on planet earth in our midst. He's talking about the activity of God, what God is up to. And some of you remember early in our series in Matthew that when he's talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is heard as being synonymous with several things. That the kingdom of God is, is about bringing joy and peace, healing, reconciliation between human beings and God, between human beings with one another. It's about making things right where things have gone wrong in the world. And so when he tells us to store up treasures in heaven, he's talking about investing ourselves in the work of God, the reign of God, the activity of God here on the earth. He's talking about focusing our lives. And in this case, for this teaching, our monetary resources in the reign of God on the earth, in what God is doing. And he's all about restoring people to himself and people to one another. He's all about meeting real needs. You just saw the advertisement for CRF. We've been drilling wells there for the last several years. 600,000 people having access to water. That's the kingdom of God. And many of you have been a part of that in investing in that. That he's about bringing joy and peace and healing and making things right where they've gone wrong in the world. There's there's. Countless other examples in the life of our church of you being invested in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is saying, treasure these things. Treasure the kingdom. Treasure the work of God. Treasure the reign of God. Treasure what God is doing. Invest your life and resources in these things. One of the biggest misnomers is that Jesus is calling people to reject money. That's what a lot of people think. He's not calling you to reject money in the least. After all, being poor is not an ideal strategy for helping the poor. 
It's not. For instance, there are many business owners among us who are doing an important thing in providing jobs for people. That your business isn't just about making money that you can share and provide for your family and share with others who are in need. Literally, your business is providing a value for others to have jobs. Jesus is not against us having money and material possessions. Jesus is against money and material possessions having us. And if we're going to have them, you have to keep your eyes open, which then sets you up for his next teaching. Verse 22, keep reading. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of lights. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Let's just leave that slide up. I want you to be able to meditate on this teaching here. Jesus says, hey, uh, literally through my eyes, my body is enlightened. One of the roles of your eyes is to take in light to give your whole body vision. That's one of the ways your eyes work, to take in light, to help you see and adjust your life accordingly. But if your eye is bad, if your eyes aren't taking in the light that they're designed to take in, then your vision is diminished and it won't be long to where you're bumping into things in the dark. What makes for bad eyesight, according to Jesus, here? When I'm focused on material things and my thingdom, instead of my king and his kingdom. And before I know it, I wind up stumbling around in the darkness. Jesus says to be careful that the light within me is not darkness. What does he mean by that? We're like that five-year-old little girl who thought, well, if her dad doesn't have enough money, just charge it. She thinks she's in the light for how to buy things, when really she's in the dark, and if she makes decisions like that, it won't be long to where she's in a world of hurt with a credit card at 20% interest. Be careful that the light within you is not darkness. There's a lot of wisdom in our world about money and material possessions, and, and people think it's light, when really it's darkness. And haven't we all found ourselves a time or two when it comes to money and material possessions. Haven't we all found ourselves stumbling around in the darkness and stubbing our toes when we've been too focused on our thingdoms? I've, stug, I've stubbed my toes so much on a couple of different realities when it comes to money and material possessions, just in my own life. For example, there's the reality that money and material possessions are so uncertain. In fact, Paul tells Timothy this. It's not on the screen, but 1 Timothy 6 is just coming to mind. He says, hey, be careful that you don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Value changes constantly. Like the old saying goes, among the things money can't buy is what it used to. You've heard that money talks. What does money say? I've learned as I get older, money says goodbye a lot. Value changes. Not only can things increase in price and other things drop in value, then there's the reality that time takes a toll on things. Uh, it's interesting that Jesus brings up moth and rust, destroying things. In the ancient world, moth and rust were seen as literal consumers of clothes and treasures to where they're no longer worth what people paid for them. Now, you may not deal with moths and rust the way they did in the ancient world, but you know, you deal with depreciation. You deal with the ravages of time. How many of us have ever been upside down because we found a car we couldn't live without and we took out this massive loan and now the car isn't so great anymore, but we can't even get what we get out what we owe for the car without taking a financial bath. A lot of us know what it is to deal with depreciation and the ravages of time to where before we know it, we're completely upside down and something is not worth what we've paid for it or what we've borrowed for it. You know what, one of the healthiest things all of us could do, we probably ought to all have a worship service one weekend in the middle of a junkyard in Louisville. Really, it'd be healthy for us because that's where everything is going. And according to Jesus, it's not wise for earthly treasures to be the chief end of my life. And if it is, I'm walking around in the dark. I'm setting myself up for anxiety and frustration and pain 
We associate money and resources with freedom, but so often we wind up enslaved, which then takes you to the next teaching of Jesus. It's amazing, the wisdom of Jesus here. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It's interesting what Jesus says here. Jesus says serving God and money simultaneously, it's not just undesirable, it's undoable. Jesus says it can't be done. Now, we still want to find out for ourselves whether or not it can be. (laughs) It's hard to take Jesus' word for it, you know. But he says, this thing is undoable. You can't serve both God and money. When it comes to serving God and serving money, you cannot multitask. You can't do it. Some people have dual citizenship in our world. They live in one state or one country a little less than six months, and then they live in another a little less than six months. Dual citizenship may be possible. Dual lordship is not possible. I've told you before, there's no such thing as a throne pew. You see a pew in a church, multiple people can sit on it. There's no such thing as a throne pew. It's not you and God sitting on a love seat. It's not God and money sitting on a love seat. Jesus says you have to make a choice. And in essence, he's saying, I'm really talking about who you're going to worship. Money and material possessions can be incredible servants to the purposes of God. But I'm going to tell you what, they are terrible masters when they're not surrendered to the purposes of God. And all too often, we can wind up possessed by our possessions or by our desire for possessions. I've always thought one of my credit cards is so appropriately titled MasterCard. Well, I felt that way. Jesus would say elsewhere in Luke 12 and 15, watch out. He's telling you, Watch out, have your head on a swivel, your eyes open. Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. When's the last time you were on guard against greed? A lot of us are a walking invitation for it. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. The fact that Jesus tells you to watch out for this tendency ought to tell you something, that I'm vulnerable to being mastered by my relationship with money and material possessions. The funny thing about greed and materialism is he says, watch out. It's almost like you need to treat it like a virus. Now, here's what's so ironic. This thing is like a virus. It really is, which anyone can catch. Jesus says, watch out, everyone, watch out. This thing's like a virus, which anyone can catch, but none of us think we've ever caught it. Do you remember during COVID how many people had COVID, but they were adamant about not admitting that they have COVID? I don't have it. I don't have it. Sometimes we're that way about this. This is a virus any of us can catch, but none of us would say we've caught it. You know what makes the difference between a piece of glass being made into a window and a piece of glass being made into a mirror. Silver lining. You just add silver to one side of that pain and you cease to see through it and all you can do is see your reflection in it. When silver lining gets added to our life, there's just a tendency to drift into being mastered by our reflection in it to where all we can see is ourselves and our concerns. The question is, how does the mastery happen? And I think there are a couple things that Jesus identifies in his teaching right after this in Matthew 6, 25 through 34, which really we're going to read that whole passage next weekend and walk through it. But I just, I want to show you two things out of this passage though this weekend that have something to do with that tells you how I can drift into being mastered by my money or my relationship with my possessions. The first is this, we drift through an assault of anxiety. 
So if you're looking in your Bibles, the very next verse after this teaching on money, what's the very next verse? Jesus says, therefore. What have I taught you about therefore in the Bible? Anytime you see a therefore, you need to ask, what's it there for? <laughs> well, in other words, what he's saying, what I'm about to say is connected to what I've just said. I've just been talking to you about being mastered by money. Therefore, what's his next line? I tell you, do not worry. Jesus is connecting the struggle with money and material possessions with anxiety. Three different times in this next passage, he will tell his disciples to not worry or not be anxious about what they will eat or drink or wear. What's the overarching connection between these two passages? Our struggle with money and possessions is so often rooted in anxiety and worry. Really is. This is how we wind up in idolatry. A lot of us are driven into idolatry out of anxiety and worry. Sometimes it's the idolatry of money. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's the idolatry of a relationship or a job. It can be a, they idolat a lot of us are driven into some kind of idolatry trying to deal with our anxiety and our worry. So what's the antidote over and over in that next passage? What does Jesus keep telling them? Your father, your father, your father, your father. He's reminding them over and over. God is your father growing in my understanding and experience of the fatherhood of God who cares about me, who knows what I'm facing, has a lot to do with me not allowing my anxiety to get the best of me in a way that it leads me to being mastered by money and possessions. There's another thing that leads to drifting, and it's what I would call a lack of intentionality. So in the course of his teaching, you go down a few more verses in Matthew 6, he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, him making things right, him making things whole. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. What's he doing? He's connecting something here. He's helping them to see something. It's interesting that earlier in Matthew 6, 10, what does he tell them to pray for? What did we learn about last week? Pray for our Father in heaven, our, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He teaches them to pray for the kingdom to come in the early part of Matthew 6. Now what is he doing? He's telling them, I want you to seek the kingdom first. It's one thing to pray for the kingdom to come. That's good. But then there's a time to move to seeking the kingdom first. And he tells them, I want you to seek the kingdom first with your relationship with money and material possessions. I want you to think about who Jesus is saying this to. He's not saying this to the wealthy of the day. He's saying this to his disciples, to, to the Jewish people, blue-collar laborers and peasants who are living under a crippling weight of the Roman Empire, crippling taxes. He's saying this to people who themselves are in poverty, and Jesus is telling them to seek the kingdom first? with what little they have, this is a challenging word that calls for us to trust God as Father and to prioritize his reign, his kingdom over our thingdoms. I think it's worth asking all of ourselves a question with a passage like this. What evidence do I have in my life right now that I'm seeking the kingdom with the resources I presently have. I'm not asking about what I wish I could do. I'm not asking about what, uh, hey, what's your plan one day? What will you do with what you have one day? I'm asking at this present moment and looking back over the last few months of my life, what evidence is there that I'm seeking the kingdom with the resources I presently have? I'll never forget how this was brought home to me Several years ago by my brothers and sisters in Mbali, Uganda, Tim Ketcherson and I went over to Mbali, Uganda, and I was preaching in the bush there, a rural area, and we're meeting with a, a good-sized church on a concrete slab. This was a church that had something to work with, <laughs> with four walls and a thatched roof. No windows. They just had holes in the wall for ventilation. And most of these people that belonged to this church lived in places with no electricity, no running water, and they had a time for the offering. And I was thinking to myself, they're taking an offering? Of what? What do they have? And I saw these wicker baskets at the front of this meeting space. And people were bringing for 
small amounts of Ugandan currency and then fruit and vegetables and chickens. I mean, it was a zoo. But it must have been beautiful in the Lord's sight. From an earthly perspective, if there was anybody that had a reason not to give and to hang on to every resource they have, it's these precious people. There was a part of me I was fighting in my flesh. I wanted to tell them, don't do it. But they would just hear that as, don't trust God. And they'd be right. And yet when Hurricane Ike blew through Houston earlier that year, that church took up an offering that amounted to 21 American dollars and sent it to a church in Houston, a church in Mbali, Uganda, to help this Houston church in relief efforts. I suppose the story that touched me the most, though, was we, we were over there and we were talking about uh, helping to launch a Christian university. It would be the only Christian university in Uganda and Kenya. The branch was a partner in this. In fact, we helped buy the 60 acres that today a Christian university has now been on there more than a decade, I believe. And we were over there on this survey tour. And while we were there, there was an advisory board meeting made up of just uh, the Ugandan natives, the indigenous Christians to Uganda. They wanted to meet among themselves by themselves. And so they met by themselves while we were in the midst of the planning stages for this Christian university. And they come out of their meeting and they tell us, we've taken up an offering among ourselves. Here it is. It amounted to 61 American dollars. And then they said this, I will never forget this as long as I live. They said, we've decided we will never meet as an advisory board without taking up an offering among us for the work. Cool. Let me tell you why that hit me. Because there are plenty of advisory boards in America in nonprofit work that people meet to advise and they don't give a dime to their own work that they're advising. They said, we'll never meet without taking up an offering ourselves and investing in what we say we're advising. Whew. That was convicting to me because a lot of us just want to serve God in an advisory capacity. We want, to, we want to advise, we want to advise others without investing ourselves. Whew. They taught me what it is to truly trust God as Father with what they have and to prioritize his kingdom over their thingdoms as little as their thingdoms were in one sense. There's a third thing I would say of how we drift. It's not in that text, but I, I will go ahead and share this just from the wisdom of scripture. I call it a lack of internal auditing. We drift through a lack of internal auditing. What I mean is we stop watching out when it comes to our relationship with money and material things. Sometimes a little internal auditing can help. Let me just, let me give you a, an example of a few questions that I ask myself on occasion. I think these are healthy questions for us to ask. Have you ever made a major life decision influenced more by money than by God? Do your cares or your anxieties over money or your efforts to get more money regularly choke out time with God in his word, in prayer, in reflection, or time with your family or your loved ones? Have you ever compromised an ethical standard for financial gain? Have you ever risked or sacrificed a friendship because of an argument over money? When you're with friends, do you spend more time talking about money matters than you do about matters of life or faith or spirituality? Do you think, do you worry more about giving your children a financial heritage than you do a spiritual heritage? Would you describe yourself as a contented person when it came to money and material possessions, would other people describe you as a contented person? Would you be willing to live on 10 times what you give in the course of a year to charitable causes in the name of Jesus Christ? Would you be willing to live on 10 times what you give in a year?
When's the last time you gave of your resources to something consistent with God's kingdom and it was a sacrifice? In other words, when's the last time you went without something you wanted for a while because of what you were dedicating of your resources to this initiative in the kingdom? They're challenging questions. But they're part of watching out and staying aware. We have in God we trust printed on our money. But this is about having it engraved on our hearts. And we're not just called to pray for the kingdom of God to come in its fullness. We're called to seek it first. On that same trip to Uganda, Tim Ketcherson and I stayed in a missionary's home. And shortly after we returned, that home burned completely down an electrical fire within two months of us coming back. And it's not uncommon to have electrical fires there because of the poor electrical work in the homes. In a matter of minutes, these sweet missionaries and their two children lost absolutely everything in the house, all their treasures of both financial value and sentimental value, all the kids' stuff, everything was in ashes. And there's no such thing as homeowner's insurance or fire insurance in Uganda. It's all gone. And in the year that followed, the branch worked together. Some of you were in on this with other churches to help them rebuild their lives there. But here's what I want you to hear that the wife wrote me just weeks after losing about everything they own. Amidst the rubble of our house, one item survived the inferno, a metal cross that hung prominently in the living room. That poignant picture speaks so loudly. In a world where moth and rust corrupt, this is what she wrote, where thieves break in and steal and fire reduces homes to ash in a matter of minutes, the cross stands alone. The only permanence in this world is found in Christ and the message of his cross. This remains true. No matter what tragedy assaults us, even if our world literally falls down around us, our heartfelt prayer in this season is that much as we will grieve certain of our precious possessions, the message that will be clear in our hearts and to those around us is that we have lost nothing of real or eternal value. Even in the face of them learning, l losing so much of their earthly thingdom. They were focused on the kingdom of God and were trusting God as Father. There's a difference between the provision and the provider. There's a difference between the blessing and the blesser. And just because the provisions and the blessings are gone from one's life doesn't mean that the provider and the blesser is. The ways, the means, the provisions, the blessings that God uses to take care of us may not be there tomorrow, but he will. They may change, but he won't. And knowing and believing that makes all the difference in the world in us seeking the kingdom first with what we have today. Mother Teresa was right. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow may never come. We have only today to love Jesus. And so may God help all of us who are vision impaired to see a little more clearly and to seek first the kingdom this week in the midst of all our silver lining. I'm gonna ask you to take what you have for communion. I left you two questions to meditate on in communion. As we remember our Lord, who according to 2 Corinthians 8, 
for our sakes, though he was rich in the most important of ways, he became poor so that we, through his poverty upon the cross, might become rich. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen. Hmm. And so, Lord, right now as we take a wafer that reminds us of your body, a bit of juice that reminds us of your blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins, right now at this moment, I'm thinking about myself at the foot of the cross and all of my own sins that have to do with my relationship with money and material possessions. And again, I say I'm sorry and I ask your forgiveness and I'm so grateful for your work upon the cross for you willingly released it all so that all of us through your poverty might become wealthy in the most important of ways, might be forgiven and renewed. Oh, blessed are the poor in spirit, and we all say we are spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we are so grateful for new beginnings and fresh starts. And we are so excited about opportunities to seek first your kingdom through how we relate to what we have. Perhaps it's through the opening up of our homes and being more hospitable, the sharing of our things, the giving more generously on the spot to someone in need. Perhaps it's being better steward of what we have and not being so reckless in the wrong ways and learning to be a little more reckless in the right ways of generosity and radical, radical support of your kingdom's cause. Lord, we thank you for your presence. And we thank you for the believers in our life, and we all have them, who've taught us what it is to steward the silver lining well. And we truly say, Lord, we long for it to be engraved on our heart. In God we trust. To trust you like Jesus has, surrendering himself fully to you. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
Thanks so much for being with us. We are so glad to worship with you. As always, spend a little bit of time in prayer today at the close of our service, asking the Lord what He wants you to do differently this week. And we can't wait to see you next time.